Okay, so hello everyone. This is Appenzeller podcast, and today we have Professor Edward Choi from USC as our guest. Hello, Professor. Hello. Nice yeah. to nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah, and today our topic is unlocking the power of higher education and research. And first, let's start from the introduction. So I'm the host. My name is Faruza. I'm from Underwood Division, freshman first semester. And my name is Miras Kalabai. I am freshman second semester uh, from the IC department and a C major. Okay. Now, Professor, can you tell us about yourself, about like, your study, research areas, everything like that? How did you come to UIC? How did uh, you become yeah. professor? Like everything, that like, brief introduction. Every, everything? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you me. might have to give me specific prompts along the way. Um, yeah. So um, my name is Edward, Edward Choi, and um, uh, I'm teaching currently RDQM, Research Design and Quantitative Methods, and sometimes I teach Sociology of Education uh, during the off-seasons. Yeah. Um, how I came to UIC, mm -hmm. I guess I could talk a little bit about my research Yeah, first. yeah, also you can, about your educational background, like your ah, yes, mm -hmm. yes, universities, yeah, yeah. Yes, everything yes. like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, my academic background um, relates to international and comparative higher education. So looking at different education systems uh, from a um, cross-national, international, and comparative perspective. Um, and also, uh, it's, it's, it's about, uh, to a large extent, looking at the relationship between education systems and society. Mm -hmm. Seeing how social forces impact educational outcomes, and, and vice versa, how yeah. educational practices uh, affect lifetime outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I have uh, training... Um, well, I guess uh, moving away from this language of training. So um, I uh, studied at Boston College as an undergraduate student. I studied economics. Upon graduating from uh, Boston College, uh, I found myself working in the field of social work for about three years after getting a degree in, in nonprofit management. Um, so, um, so, you know, working in the field of social work for about three years uh, about 80% of my work involved um, administrative level stuff. So uh, I would oversee the financial operations and human resources uh, of the organization uh, that I worked at. Um, it was a social service agency uh, that provided services running the whole gamut of yeah. services. So from child care to uh, uh, gerontology, yeah. um, so on and so forth. And about 20% of my work involved working on the front line, so yeah. to speak. So I worked with at-risk students. Mm. And um, so, uh, you know, as part of that, I spearheaded an after-school program, um, a middle school after-school program. And, um, and I, I tutored and facilitated workshops at a high school as well. Uh, so, so doing all of that, it got me interested in education and I wanted to deeply explore how uh, education can impact lifetime outcomes and I found myself applying to uh, Columbia University um, and uh, I received a master's degree in international educational development from there. Um, and then I, I went on to get a PhD uh, from Boston College. So I went back to Boston College. <laughs> Uh, you know, they call me a double eagle there because the mascot is an eagle. And um, and uh, so after that, after completing my studies, I came to Korea in the thick of COVID-19 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and was looking for work. And fortunately, um, a position opened up here at Yonsei University. Uh, and, uh, you know, the rest is history, I guess. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. So your parents live here in Korea, right? Yes, oh. yes. My immediate family members, barring my sister, oh. uh, they live here. So my sister oh. lives in, in Philadelphia. And how did you end up in the United States? So I was, I was born there. Oh. Yeah, my parents, um, uh, you know, went there um, when I was in my uh, mother's uh, belly. <laughs> uh, I, was, I, yeah. was, I was almost born on, on, on the flight over. Oh. Wow. Um, and that would have been great because I think I would have been able to fly at no yeah, cost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, <laughs> but there was a delay, and so so that's how oh. I, I came to live in the mm -hmm. states. Yeah. That's so you graduated high school in the United States. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So continuing and moving on. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the students. 
For students interested in conducting research, what advice do you have for them? I would say there are many, many things to consider, mm -hmm. um, but perhaps I'm not sure if this is first and foremost. But students should have a good idea as to what research entails. Mm -hmm. um, they should know the limitations of, of whatever methods they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So um, I would, if, if I were a student and if I were conducting research, I would first understand uh, what it is that I plan to do. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, whether we're kind of imbibing information by reading books, subscribing to podcasts. Uh, taking formal curricula or non-formal curricula, right? These days, I, I believe that there's a, kind of a, a preponderance of, of, of different ways yeah. to receive an education, uh, including formal and non-formal. So um, first and foremost, you know, I think students have to have a good understanding as to what they want to do, mm -hmm. um, know the limitations, because yeah. I've seen students embark on, uh, you know, trying to do something, uh, you know, quantitatively, and then later find out that there are just so many things to consider. Mm -hmm. um, so having a good knowledge relating to methodology, relating to methods, and knowing the limitations of each uh, methods and, and methodologies, uh, I think that that's that would be good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we can move on to the courses you teach. Yeah. And sure. Yeah, the university. Mm -hmm. So what courses do you currently teach, and why do you consider them important for students? At UIC or yeah, 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 in general. yeah general great, engine. great question, great question. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I teach research design and quantitative methods. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you know we're talking about the full cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, planning research, uh, designing research, um, choosing appropriate methods based on whatever methodology, methodological orientation uh, you have, um, and also understanding yourself as a researcher. Right, uh, you know, in my RDQM yeah. class, we yeah. talk about uh, epistemology and ontology. <laughs> right, based yeah. on these worldviews, you're either a, uh, you know, broadly speaking, a qualitative researcher or a quantitative researcher. Um, you know, we can talk about critical realists, uh, but uh, you know, I do not want to bore you. Um, but so I do teach RDQM, and then mm -hmm. and then being able to choose the appropriate analysis method based on the research question, yeah. based on the research mm -hmm. design, based on the type of variables that you're working with, based on uh, whether or not you're meeting data assumptions. Um, I believe that RDQM, research design and quantitative methods, generally quantitative methods is very important um, at at many organizations and and at many different levels. So whether you're working at the level of the government, right, nationally, yeah. or whether you're working at, you know, um, a social service agency, uh, whether you're working at that supranational level, so yeah. beyond nation states, at yeah. some international organization, uh, we all want to make informed decisions, right? Uh, decisions that impact um, a lot of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we want to make decisions that impact a lot of people, from my perspective, we want to make informed decisions. Yeah. And this is where quantitative research comes into play. Um, you know, uh, quantitative research mostly looks at aggregate stuff, right? Uh -huh. Averages and et cetera, et cetera. Inferential statistics, right? Um, so um, in order to make those informed decisions, from my perspective, it makes sense not to make decisions based on a single case or even 10 cases, yeah. but based on what the aggregate trends are telling us, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so from my perspective, that's one of the reasons why quantitative research is so important. Uh, mm -hmm. It helps us make informed okay. decisions. Yeah, and also you teach this seminar, right? Like this. Yes, thing. I do teach sociology mm -hmm. of education. Yeah. Um, um, what is that yeah. course about? I'm I'm thinking like also taking that <laughs> course. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. welcome you. Yeah. Um, so uh, sociology of education is kind of like what I uh, was talking about earlier, looking at education systems, looking yeah. at society, and trying to interrogate the relationships between those two, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, seeing how social forces impact educational outcomes. Mm -hmm. And wh what do I mean by educational outcomes? I'm talking about, for example, attainment rates, oh. academic achievement gap, um, persistence rates, for example, yeah. right? Whether or not students drop out. So. Uh, what social forces are important to discuss and consider 
uh, relative to uh, discussing these educational outcomes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also also about looking at different social status groups. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what do I mean by social status groups? I'm talking about minority groups, mm-hmm. different ethnic groups, uh, social economic classes, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. They all experience education differently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so what social forces are important to consider uh, relative to talking about these different groups? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also about the opposite um, so looking at a relationship, right? Uh, we're talking about a bi-directional yeah, yeah. relationship. Um, so looking at an educational practice uh, or educational practices uh, preserve the yeah. status quo. Yeah. Um, looking at educational practice exacerbate inequities yeah. in society. Looking at educational practices compensate for uh, inequities in society. So in a nutshell, that's what sociology of education oh. is about. Uh, In my particular class, we also take a global and international perspective, a comparative and international perspective. So so we compare countries uh, and education systems as well. Yeah, it sounds really good. She always recommends like uh, taking me. Yeah, like like, I'm the biggest like promoter of your course. Yeah, yeah, I'm like take... Edward Choi, if you're taking yeah. RTQM, I'm gonna take his seminar. Take his oh yeah, oh. she always encourages me to take like a UIC yeah. seminar next. Semester. So I guess I'll see you next I sometime. Think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you. good. So, uh, moving on to the topic of higher education. Yeah. Now, yeah. let's discuss it. So, what do you think about the current state of higher education? Is it like still as relevant as in the past? Could mm. like your mm. high school higher education diploma like get yeah. your job the that yeah. you want yeah. yeah what do you think about that i think that's an important question and i think that requires or calls for um, a comprehensive answer looking at multiple things multiple factors um you know uh in the brief time that we have i think education formal education that is is yeah. still very relevant in society yeah. um, we can talk about public benefits and we could also talk about private benefits so what do I mean by public benefits? I mean externalities. So, um, you know, there's a lot of research looking at uh, the, the relationship between, for example, GDP yeah. uh, and other, you know, national level outcomes yeah. um, and uh, something like educational attainment, right? Oh, yeah. uh, the attainment of degrees, um, academic performance, et cetera. And there's a positive correlation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so if we're, if we're kind of zooming out and, and looking at relationships uh, from like a bird's eye view, education does matter um, in that sense. So, but these are more instrumental purposes. Like yeah. if we're talking about GDP, we're talking about like economic benefits, yeah. but there are also cu- cultural benefits. You know, mm-hmm. some research points to um, the relationship between, for example, smoking mm-hmm. and, and, and education, right? Wow. In, in countries um, where, where there's a saturation of degrees, yeah. um, mm-hmm. on average, there might be less smoking. Wow. Um, so there's research, um, you know, looking at that as well. Um, now, if we move on to the private benefits, yeah. um, so we're talking about, we're also still talking about economic benefits yeah. as well. And so utilitarian benefits, yeah. so instrumental benefits. So um, I would say for the vast majority of cases, the vast majority of students, um, that education matters. Education mm-hmm. plays a significant role. Um, if we're talking about, for example, social mobility, upward yeah. social mobility, yeah. right? There's a lot of research looking at um, the relationship between uh, educational attainment, you know, whether or not you have a bachelor's degree versus a higher education degree mm-hmm. or versus a professional degree mm-hmm. and, and kind of seeing uh, trends in, in earnings yeah. over, over one's lifespan. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think much of the evidence points to the very, very reality that if you have a higher education degree versus a bachelor's degree, you're going to make more money. Mm-hmm. You're going to make more, more, more money in the long run. Um, you're going to be able to secure a better job, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, this is not to say that there are outliers. Yeah. That there are outliers. Of course, there are outliers. Yeah. And for example, like Mark Zuckerberg, and, yeah. you know, who dropped out of college and are making billions right now. I know mm-hmm. friends who've dropped out of high school and are making more money than I am. <laughs> yeah. um, but these, I would say, from my perspective, and, you know, based on my limited research, that these are indeed outliers, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Um, I'll, so I'll give you I'll give you an example. Um, for the vast majority of students, education still matters, and I'll give you an example. I have a friend, very smart person, brilliant person. Mm-hmm. He studied coding by by watching YouTube videos, yeah. right? He was able to secure a, a very prestigious job at a major corporation here in Korea as yeah. a senior programmer. Mm-hmm. But he's hitting a glass ceiling. Yeah, he's hitting a glass ceiling. He can't advance mm-hmm. career wise. Um, he, you know, he wants to switch companies. Mm-hmm. He had multiple interviews, but but no callback. 
And why is that the case, right? And, and you know, we, we thought about this a little bit, and perhaps it has to do with the very fact that a formal educational degree signals a certain value in the market, yeah. to the market, right? It signals good work ethic. It signals uh, you can work under pressure. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you can work uh, competitively, et cetera, et cetera. Now, yeah. can my friend do all this? Absolutely, yes. But to the employer and the recruiter, yeah. right? Um, they perceive a formal educational degree as being yeah. superior mm -hmm. to whatever else yeah. there is out there, a certificate or That's just you know, um, you know, watching YouTube yeah, yeah. clips, right? Um, so for the vast majority of cases, I would say that education matters, formal education matters. Yeah. If we're talking about instrumental goals, if we're talking oh. about social mobility. Mm -hmm. Actually, yes. Even my mom had the same situation. So my mom has the bachelor's degree in economics, in banking, yeah. and she works in a bank. Yeah. And uh, she also like she was promoted to like higher position. Yeah. And she also like kind of hit the glass ceiling because yeah. she had to get like MBA or yeah. master's yeah. degree to yeah. be promoted like the, her both like see on you that she has all the qualities but yeah. he was like yeah to get this job like officially to get higher pay you have to get the mba degree yeah, yeah, exactly. and she had to yeah she, exactly. yeah she went to get the degree yeah, yeah so yeah that's true unfortunately that's the case right yeah. value is socially determined yeah um and uh you know right now yeah. um educational degrees yeah. have market currency yeah mm -hmm. true okay and can you tell about your personal, like how higher education help you in achieving like your goals, your uh, objectives? How did it help me? Yeah. Um, I would say uh, it was significant in shaping who I am as a mm -hmm. person. So just like moving away from a discussion of academics, uh, when I think of higher education, when I think of my college experience, I think of friends, yeah. right? I think of the good times I had. Um, uh, with my friends, the relationships I was uh, able to form. Um, so, you know, my friends had a significant impact on who I am. You know, peer influence is real, yeah. right? And based on the research, peer influence is significant. Um, so, uh, I guess, I guess, you know, education, higher education, college, you know, undergraduate degrees, uh, my undergraduate degree, um, and, and perhaps the other degrees I have, I would say, uh, it's a space where propinquity, right, yeah. um, can be triggered. And what do I mean by propinquity? I mean, I mean, um, you know, people coming together frequently yeah. because of they're because they're enrolled in, in in a class or because they're enrolled at a certain institution, right? That frequency mm -hmm. has a significant impact on who I become friends yeah. with, mm -hmm. um, and also. Um, you know, uh, homophily, we could talk about it, depending on how you pronounce that word, um, homophily, right? Um, you know, friendships formed uh, based on common values, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So these all come into play. And, and for me, uh, you know, higher education uh, played a significant role in shaping my yeah. character. Mm -hmm. uh, in shaping my character, yeah. yeah. So shaping soft skills rather yeah, than yeah, hard yeah. skills. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, moving on. Uh, we're going to talk about... Uh, both academic motivation, yeah. So, in the ever evolving world of academia, how do you stay motivated and engaged in your research? Or oh, do you, in your studies. Yeah, in your studies. My studies yeah. Research, yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. um, I would say students play a significant role. Like, mm -hmm. uh, the critical questions that they ask in class um, <laughs> pushes me to broaden my horizons, uh, to listen to another podcast, to read another book. Um, you know, I want to stay current. I want to stay, especially in my sociology of education course. I think it's very important to be uh, apprised of current mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm constantly in, in that class. I'm constantly, you know, reading news articles, um, trying to update my my knowledge as much as I can. So uh, students, so you know, two way communication, right? Yeah. I emphasize yeah. dialogue in my classes, yeah. so we can co construct knowledge. Um, so yes, yeah, students. Um, uh, Keep me accountable, I would say. <laughs> Y'all yeah. keep me accountable, yeah, yeah. so that's great. Um, other uh, practical ways, uh, uh, you know, I, I sign up for newsletters, mm -hmm. right? I receive newsletters from Inside Higher Ed, yeah. from uh, University World News. Uh, if there's an interesting article, I read it. Uh, sometimes these articles cite empirical studies uh, or mm -hmm. uh, other types of studies. So, you know, it's like a snowball effect. Yeah. Um, and when I read an article, I look at the reference list. And uh, that article leads to additional articles. Yeah. Um, so you know, mm -hmm. I guess I guess those are the ways 
that I stay motivated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that I stay motivated mm-hmm. uh, in the research that I do. And also colleagues, like my colleagues internationally would, would suggest something. Yeah. And um, if it would, if it piques my interest, then, yeah. you know, we keep each other accountable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Okay. And what would you recommend to students who are listening to us how to maintain the productivity? Yeah, like how to, as you, like your motivation, I think, is as a as an adult i think it's you're more conscious and what would you recommend to the students like us what we should do to be like to keep our focus to stay yeah, motivated yeah. Mm-hmm. that's a great question um a difficult question to answer um but i would say um i want to say motivation levels but then again the question becomes you know what drives motivation levels up yeah. right um social capital mm-hmm. relational capital yeah. so uh, peers peer networks mm-hmm. and friends yeah. mm-hmm. um, you know there's research looking at peer networks and, and social capital and the relationship that all of this has with for example depression levels mm-hmm. right um, and all of this uh, for example uh, relationship with for example other other uh, educational outcomes yeah. um, education specific outcomes um, so you know I would say motivation um, because there is a, a relationship between motivation and academic performance, yeah. mm-hmm. right? But how do we keep that motivation up? I would say uh, peer networks and social capital are very important. Yeah. Um, so, you know, step outside of your comfort zone to make yeah. friends, <laughs> right? To join clubs, yeah. Yeah. Um, to send emails to yeah. faculty members, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're eager to receive emails from students. Yeah. Um, we want to develop that rapport. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say, you know, step outside of your comfort zone. It's a, it's a time of experimentation. Mm-hmm. It, you know, these are the formative years of your life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, so I guess that's my suggestion. Okay, well, that's a great answer. Great yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do. <laughs> okay, next, our segment is uh, University Life Essentials. So... In your opinion, what is the single most important thing in university life for students? It's on the yeah. yeah. Single most important thing. That's 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 hard to answer. Um, GPA. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what's that? GPA. Yeah. 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 I'm just oh, joking. <laughs> yeah. I guess this this you know this kind of connects to um, the conversation we were having earlier yeah. about yeah. motivation levels and, yeah. and having. A constructive social life, yeah. right? And constructive might be the operative word here. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to single out a single factor, yeah. um, but just enjoy the college experience. Again, you know, step outside, nudge yourself outside of whatever comfort yeah. zone that you're familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, form those friendships. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, break those cultural barriers, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> form those friendships. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, more or less, I guess, you know, what I, what I described earlier. Yeah. yeah. When you, we speak about like your higher, like your life in uh, university, I always remember how you told us that you had blonde hair. Right? Yes, I did. I bleached my hair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the only thing that morning. comes to my mind. Oh, you really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> only I, sh- yeah. yeah. I should have mentioned that in yeah. class. Actually, I always talk about you, you know, like sometimes, from time to time, you, like, you always pop up in our conversation. Really? Yeah, yeah. Really? most of the time. Hopefully yeah. good stuff. Good yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah, only good, good stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, uh, about educational systems in U.S. and Korea. Ooh. So, having experienced education in both the U.S. and Korea, mm. what differences have you observed between the two systems? I think there are many things that we can talk about here. Um, external governance, right? Yeah. So, I'm talking about uh, accountability mm-hmm. uh, by governments, by municipalities, by you know accreditation boards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there are differences uh, regarding that. Uh, differences in terms of enrollment figures, difference in terms of institutional count. Yeah. Um, you know, U.S. has around four thousand institutions, give or take. Uh, Korea has um, uh, high three hundreds, okay. high three hundreds, I believe, uh, or like low four hundreds. I'm not sure. I have to look at the data again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, there are so many differences to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can talk about competition as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, what, what's the follow-up question regarding this? Oh, 
in your perspective, is one education system better oh, than yeah. the other? And, and why? Yeah. That's, a, yeah. <laughs> that's a hard question to answer because I think we can't ignore context, yeah. right? Yeah. Institutions, uh, organizations have yeah. developed and been shaped, uh, you know, within their kind of social political histories, yeah. um, social political cultural histories and economic mm-hmm. histories as well. Um, so, you know, the only thing I have to say, I mean, f- you know, certainly we can talk about international rankings, for yeah. example, yeah. right? <laughs> and there's a concentration of, of, of these universities and international ranking yeah. league tables, whereas, you know, there might not be so many of these institutions yeah. in those yeah. league tables. Um, we, can, we can talk about that. But I would say, if I had to answer this question, um, I would say that context matters and the institutions are suitable to that context. Mm. Um, and of course, I think I, it becomes interesting when you study that context and now instead of making international comparisons, because oftentimes it's difficult to make international mm. comparisons yeah. because we yeah. don't want to draw policy lessons from one yeah. country. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to take something wholesale and replicate it mm-hmm. in, in the context of Korea, for example, yeah. because there are cultural factors to consider. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But within each country, you can then begin to talk about, you know, um, comparisons domestically, like, yeah. you know, like this policy versus that policy. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's the most more important question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And from your personal experience, like which one do you think is more like productive, like American or Korean system? Ooh, I'm scared to, I'm scared ah. to uh, give my opinion on that. So productive but, in terms of what? Uh, like more, has more benefits, advantages to the students, yeah. like from your like Again, I think context no? matters. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think okay. context okay. matters. Okay. Okay. Um, if we're talking about benefits like cross nationally, yeah. uh, certainly we can say that institutions in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, command a better reputation than institutions mm. than a lot of institutions here in Korea. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm not talking about Yonsei yeah, University. Yeah, yeah. Yonsei <laughs> University is number one. Um, <laughs> But so internationally, you know, we can have that discussion, Mm -hmm. right? An employer looking at someone from, um, you know, a U.S. based institution such as Yale or Harvard versus an institution here in Korea. um, Most likely they might. I'm not sure, actually. (laughs) It's case by case. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. that's I think that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can we move on? Yeah. I want to touch uh, touch the theme of what career education. Yeah. So, should students consider pursuing a career in education, and what benefits or disadvantages might they encounter? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think it depends on the student. Mm-hmm. If you like working with your peers, uh, you know, if you like working with students, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. if you like to be challenged intellectually, yeah. um, if you want to kind of, uh, you know, grow your intellectual capacity, mm-hmm. if you like research. Uh, perhaps uh, an academic or I mean, a professional trajectory uh, in academia is for you. Mm-hmm. Um, now there are a kind of I would say that there are a number of advantages and and drawbacks to consider. Mm-hmm. Um, and the advantages have to do with with what I just said, mm-hmm. um, what I just mentioned. For example, if you like to be you know challenged intellectually, mm-hmm. that's that's an advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, as as someone working in academia, you're constantly reading. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're, you're constantly trying to broaden your yeah. horizons. Yeah. Um, so that's there, and I, I think that's great. But drawbacks perhaps have to do with workload, mm. um, right? Uh, as a faculty member, you have to uh, concern yourself with research, with teaching and service, and um, and the sum of the, the entire workload doesn't quite equate to the sum of the parts, the constituent, the, the constitutive parts, yeah. right? There's always like an interaction effect mm-hmm. uh, between different, different, uh, uh, cert, like between research and teaching, for example. You might find yourself overwhelmed at, point, you know, uh, at certain points. Um, but you know what? That's not specific to, I would say, not yeah. specific to higher education, mm-hmm. um, right? In any industry, you're going to find yourself. Uh, oh, you know, um, sometimes having to deal with multiple assignments, mm-hmm. um, multiple responsibilities, and mm-hmm. it's it's really about time management and whether you like what you're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Whether you like yeah. what you're doing. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now back to the topic of higher education. Yeah. 
Uh, as a researcher in the field, how do you see the future trajectory of higher education? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we asked this question yeah. on our like previous yeah, episode yeah, when yeah. we had episode with Michael Hope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This professor Michael Hope. Yeah, it yeah. was his last question as yeah. a leading question to yeah. our this episode. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and the, his answer was <laughs> we had to re-record that part three times. Really? <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm interested to hear yeah, what yeah, you yeah. Have to say. And his uh, last answer was super funny. Yeah. Super funny is super creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Something <laughs> to do with Chinggis Han. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> I can't, yeah, I can't make the connection. Uh, but yeah, so. I would say that there are observable trends. Yeah. Right. For example, institutions globally are internationalizing their campuses mm -hmm. because yeah. of globalization, right? Yeah. And, uh, because we're finding um, an increase in internationally mobile students. Mm -hmm. So as institutions are receiving these diverse groups, yeah. it makes sense to internationalize campuses mm -hmm. to meet yeah. the needs of diverse student groups. And also it's about recruiting from international mm -hmm. audiences as well. Yeah. Um, so there's that trend. Um, and perhaps, um, you know, what I would like to see, if this, if, if this question relates to vision mm -hmm. in any way, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I would like to see more of an emphasis on, on increasing intercultural competence mm -hmm. rather than just increasing um, numbers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, numbers. So... Um, so it's great that you have a diversity of students mm -hmm. on yeah. campuses, but what can we do as a university? What can faculty do? What can, um, you know, uh, SAPs, so student affairs mm -hmm. professionals, mm -hmm. what can they do um, to meet the needs of diverse international groups, right? Uh, co-curricular programming is one practical solution. You know, how can we design good co-curricular programming? So uh, I believe here at Yonsei University, there's residential programming. Yeah. So yeah. perhaps yeah. that's co-curricular programming, um, you know, how can we best utilize that to mm -hmm. increase intercultural competence, awareness mm -hmm. of different cultures and appreciation of different cultures. Yeah. So, you know, I'd like to see more of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is, you know, Yonsei University is doing an amazing job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, just my general outlook. Um, and, um, you know, diversity, inclusion, that's, you know, yeah. that's always, a, that's always a, a buzzword and good to talk about mm -hmm. buzzwords. Um, something good to talk about. So, um, you know, and, and that's this is an observable trend, yeah. right? Globally, I feel like uh, there's an emphasis on inclusion and diversity, and this kind of relates to uh, internationalization in many ways. Um, yeah, I mean, that's my kind of kind of vision for higher education or what I what I expect, or what I hope to expect. Um, what else is there? Anything else? Oh, it'll come to me. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, next question is very, I think, interesting for students yeah. to watch here, get to like see the answer. So, it's life outside of academia. So, outside of your academic pursuits, do you have any hobbies or activities that you find equally fulfilling? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great question. Do I ask that? So, um, oh, but, oh, I apologize. It just came to me. So, oh. technology, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will just technology is increasingly yeah. emphasized mm -hmm. in higher education. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, but anyways, um, and I feel like technology will be, uh, will continue to be emphasized. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, innovation, like yeah. all institutional websites now talk about innovation. Yeah. Uh, in their mission statements, uh, yeah. that language is prevalent and common. Um, and that has a lot to do with technology. Um, so, okay, so uh, what do I enjoy outside of academia? Yeah. Um, yep. I enjoy cooking. Wow. Yeah, I enjoy cooking. Um, so, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always a student when it comes to cooking. Uh, so I enjoy making new dishes. Um, I'm always constantly trying to perfect existing dishes. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, the jury's still out whether or not <laughs> my, my food is great. My daughter loves my food, so that's all that matters. <laughs> um, I, I do enjoy long walks, right? Uh, yeah. By having these long nature walks, I'm able to reset. I think it's yeah. very important to, to reset the brain. Yeah. Um, and what else? I'm, I'm relearning how to play guitar. Wow. Oh. So I learned how to play guitar a very long time ago, mm -hmm. but now I'm relearning how to play guitar. Um, so right now, it's, it's funny that you asked this. Um, so my daughter is six years old, mm -hmm. and she's learning how to play piano. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're learning a song together. Um, <laughs> we're learning a song together, so that's been enjoyable. Which one? Um, how, how, how great is our God? How great is our God? Well, I, I think yeah. I heard it. Yeah. How great is our God? 
And here I, I haven't caught like so many like uh, worshiping songs yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we're learning that right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on. So I want to talk about the addressing evolving skill demands. As the job market evolves, how how can higher education institutions ensure their curricula align with the skills demanded by employers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think the I think the answer uh, would slightly change depending on on the context, depending on the national context. Um, but practical solutions may be in you know having advisory boards at the university level or perhaps at the departmental level. Um, you know, advisory boards comprised of working professionals, for example. Um, also, hiring working professionals as faculty, and you know that's this is quite common uh, across the global landscape. Um, in Korea, I would say that most institutions, because they operate within a framework um, more or less uh, created by the government, um, that that there is a prevalence of university industry partnerships. Mm -hmm. Whether we're yeah. talking about research, whether we're talking yeah. about you know field work, yeah. right? Uh, you know, practical application of knowledge mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. internships, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So. In Korea, I believe, from my perspective, based on my limited knowledge yeah. and, and research, yeah. um, that that the relationship between the market and, and higher education is yeah. very, very intimate. Mm. Is very so. There's an emphasis on vocational curricula at yeah. both universities and colleges, yeah. perhaps barring the elite institutions. Mm -hmm. um, but at most institutions here in Korea, there is a heavy emphasis on 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 vocational mm -hmm. uh, relevant courses mm -hmm. right yeah. um, you know uh, advertising for example employment mm -hmm. info yeah. like if you come to our university we're going to guarantee you a job in the government yeah. right you see that at Korean universities mm -hmm. yeah. and also yeah. junior colleges yeah. yeah that's true okay are there any specific skills you believe are particularly crucial for students entering the workforce today yeah good question um, I think hard skills are important Right, you gotta have like if you're gonna become a programmer, you need yeah. to have those hard skills. Like mm -hmm. you need knowledge in C plus mm plus -hmm. and yeah. Python, what have you, mm -hmm. right? JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think increasingly so, uh, based on what I read a long time ago, actually, mm -hmm. um, that soft skills are very important. So you know this whole kind of um, uh, discussion, be looking at EQ versus IQ. Of mm -hmm. course, IQ is important. Right, yeah, yeah, but EQ is increasingly emphasized, I believe. Right, like during an interview, the first minute or so. Uh, this is based on anecdotal evidence, by the way, yeah. not based on you know any research. Um, a, a lot of interview, a lot of my my colleagues have told me that they knew right away in the first minute. You know, this person has potential, mm -hmm. and I think that's all about EQ. Mm -hmm. That's all about EQ, like you know and. You know, soft skills like communication skills for mm -hmm. example um, leadership quality mm -hmm. right how you interact with people yeah. um, so I think that's increasingly important these days mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah and th there uh, yeah. you know I would bet my my dollar that there's a lot of research on this okay yeah, yeah. 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 also like I encountered like one of the Forbes uh, research papers yeah yeah, yeah. Like a few days ago yeah about experience tech and education tech yeah so currently like, there's uh, telling that uh, mostly in Russia and European countries, yeah. uh, hard skills are getting more important than soft skills. Okay. So, yeah, oh, really? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, like, companies currently are looking for the more professional than the more like a uh, kind of a compared like to the person who like a, uh, is more comfortable like a socially. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Okay. So hard yeah. skills matter more. So hard skills currently matter more. Yeah. Matter in a, more in a programming field. Yeah. yeah. And engineering fields. Engineering. Yeah. And this is this is uh, globally. Yeah. Or in the context of certain countries, yeah, like I think Russian and European, yeah, countries. yeah. 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 So Russian, yeah. European, yeah. and maybe okay. U.S. included okay. too, because maybe as you can see right now, uh, the employment rates kind of uh, falling down. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. companies are like hiring yeah. uh, their like a uh, workers, employers, and they're like a, I think they are seeking like a more kind of a hard skill. Like, Actually, person who can actually code actually can like a yeah 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 uh, do something like a beneficial like a yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. maybe there are some departments and like right. I think companies are kind of currently like a, kind of a big yeah they have like a many departments yeah I think yeah. a person with soft skills can find like a, a way to any company yeah like he, of course apply to the right yeah uh, yeah yeah in their field yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. That, that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Like in certain industries, like, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, performance might matter more, uh, mm-hmm. right? Outcomes might matter more, hard outcomes. Um, so there you go. So you might actually know more about this than I do. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just read some articles so about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe you can move on, yeah? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's an interesting question. I think, yeah. Mental health is a growing concern among students. How can universities create supportive environments for mental well-being of their students? So, if you know that in Yonsei, we yeah. have like a mental health department. Yes, yes, support, yeah, support, yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of support. Yeah, and uh, these counselors actually help you like, do ses- small yeah. sessions yeah, to the yeah, students. Sure, but they always like get uh, booked like a. I like think. two months in advance, oh. two months a semester in advance. Semester in advance. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. This semester. So limited spots and yeah. high demand. So yeah. yeah, like last semester, my friend tried to book, but it was already filled like until the end of summer or something like that. So what do you think the solutions are? So considering that solutions are that students should create something similar to that. So like maybe you know one of my like classes yeah. we discussed about the project that we could create kind of a, a box or maybe environment yeah. where students can actually. Uh, hire some maybe semi-professional people oh, and actually treat the students uh, with their mental health. I mean, they're not raising the awareness that there are like a lot of mental ill people, but that it's okay to actually sometimes get depressed, get uh, help from the other people and actually talk with the other. So this would be student-led I, I think, and yeah. student-funded? Uh, oh, actually, that's that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. there was Funding a is main problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. but there was a part like when he told me about that project. Yeah. Uh, actually, they wanted to like hire the prof- professionals Fishes. from the psychology facu- faculty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the, it's like perfect. I mean, that's, uh, that's like, an innovative yeah, idea. because it's also for the members of the psychology faculty. Yeah. It's a practice for them experience. Yeah, like yeah. perfect experience. If someone wants to conduct the research, right. it's perfect environment. Yeah, it also benefits for the students, for yeah. us, yeah, like yeah. the master's degree, who yeah, do yeah, yeah. master's yeah, yeah, yeah. in psychology. Yeah, yeah. yeah, also everything can be anonymous. Mm-hmm. So, so, so for them, for those psychology faculty or PhD students, yeah, um, it's it's more of a f- uh, like a field practicum. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I would I would continue to explore that idea. <laughs> yeah, we're also backed up with like a lot of research facts. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we're anywhere also confident in that students actually need that kind yeah. of help yeah maybe in this university yeah yeah they have high demand for that yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 interesting interesting i like that, I like that. <laughs> yeah thank you for sharing mm-hmm. and so in your experience how can individuals balance the demands of academia with their mental health so. i think this goes back to an early conversation we had about about social capital mm-hmm. and networks, yeah, yeah, yeah. peer networks i think peers can be of tremendous help uh, in terms of in terms of lowering depression levels, mm-hmm. um, so you know universities can create spaces where you know um, where there's an emphasis on developing these networks, yeah. developing relations, right? And uh, I go back to residential programming. Yeah. I go back to uh, co-curricular programming, yeah. right? So you know what that means practically. Perhaps hiring student affairs professionals. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure what that means practically, but yeah, I would say peers, uh, um, they would they would contribute significantly mm, yeah. to um, to to bring that balance back. Yeah, yeah, bring the balance back. But mm. uh, practical solutions, I'm not sure mm. what mm-hmm. that would look like. Mm-hmm. So, continuing education segment, do you believe in the concept of lifelong learning, and how you can universities support individuals in continuing their education beyond their initial degree? Um, I'm a fan of, of John Dewey. He's a, he's an American, uh, education reformer, mm-hmm. education, educational reformer, uh, back in the 1800s, 1900s, I would say. I don't remember the exact dates, yeah. uh, but, but he believed in lifelong learning. Um, mm-hmm. so, um, uh, you know, the continuous development of, of a set of skills, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you know, whether we're talking about hard skills or soft skills, um, so I think, I think, and if we're talking about if we're talking about that, the continuous development of these skills, they certainly have 
uh, benefit. They certainly have market value, mm-hmm. right? And not only market value, but we can talk about cultural benefits yeah. as well. Yeah. Like, you know, you just feel better. You just yeah. feel better, right? Yeah. You feel better. You feel like um, you're actually reaching that stage of, of actualization. I'm not sure if that's the right word to use, but I think I'm referring to Maslow's hierarchy where you mm-hmm. basic needs yeah, and, yeah, then, yeah. and then here's the pinnacle yeah. of actualization stage. Again, I'm not sure if that's the right word I'm using. Um, <laughs> But uh, so I think I think if we're talking about that, yes, I, I do think that lifelong learning is beneficial for both instrumental and cultural reasons. Um, and perhaps uh, employers, they require like mm. further certificates yeah. mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. You can put that on your resume. Um, uh, but so the second part of that question is what can you, institutions do? I think institutions yeah. are already doing this. Yeah. So yeah. across many universities and many junior colleges here in Korea, you'll see life learning programs. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about non-traditional students, um, so professionals, right, Mm -hmm. who want to continue their education. For whatever reason, they're able to sign up. And a lot of these programs are open access, open enrollment, Mm -hmm. I mean. Um, But some, there there are admission criteria. Mm -hmm. Uh, That depends on the school, I guess. but uh, yeah, there's a there's a prevalence of life learning programs yes. across the board, across the okay. board. So they're already in that space, from what I understand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So, yeah. yeah. It was actually the last question. Okay. Yeah. So we're done. Um, I think we can like wrap up. Yeah. The yeah. 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 Okay. So like uh, maybe we could ask like, one one last question. Yeah. Maybe pulling up there yeah. about the hobbies. Maybe can I get. So maybe can you recommend some of the favorite books or maybe films? Yeah, you've like, hmm. recently watched or like a, in your yeah, and whole also life. Like, songs. what's your favorite? Any books? Any yeah, books? Any songs, books. films? Maybe. Yeah, you could recommend something to the students to yeah. watch or to podcast read. to listen. Yeah. yeah, like anything. I'm reading right now this book called Motivation Manifesto. Mm. I think it's motivate or Manifesto Motivation, but I haven't gotten far along. Uh, so uh, so far, it's good. It's like it's more or less like a self-help book. Um, you know, I try to stay clear of those self-help books, but um, a, a young of mine, or right, like an elder brother, yeah. he recommended the book, so I'm reading that. Yeah. And so far, it's good. So, you know, if you're interested in self-help books, uh, yeah. perhaps uh, you know you 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 benefit from reading mm-hmm. the Motivation yeah. Manifesto. I believe that's the book yeah. title. Um, other books, other books. Uh, why do I keep thinking of self-help books like Who Moved My <laughs> Cheese? You know that book? Uh, that's yeah. another. That's another book that's yeah. that's great. Um, Maybe you have favorite author. Yeah, like in your in child life, your favorite book that you would recommend. So I don't remember who the author is. Yeah. Um, but I like historical nonfiction, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, historical fiction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, the book, what's the title? It's it has to do with thieves. Um, it's thieves? yeah. The the word thieves is, is in the title. Thieves. Oh, really? Yeah. It's it's thieves. <sighs> I forget. I'm very okay. forget. Yeah, I forget. <laughs> okay, it's fine. I'm very forget. But is it, um, isn't it Russian like author? No. Perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Cri- cr- crime and punishment. No, 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 no. no. It's no. not that. It's no. not that. Uh-huh. But but. Um, I do, I do. As 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 people who've, who've you know, you know, you're in my RDQM yeah, class. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I do love fantasy sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do love fantasy sci-fi. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, anything that has to do with that genre, I yeah. highly recommend. <laughs> Even if you don't like it, I highly recommend. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. a it's a form of escapism for me. Yeah. A uh, way to reset my brain. Um, movies, I'm not too sure. I just saw the um, uh, Equalizer three. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. It's with Denzel Washington. Uh-huh. Um, I thought it was a great movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Some of the scenes can be a bit gory, but if you look past that okay. and uh, if you try to understand like uh, what Denzel Washington is desiring, yeah. It's a wonderful movie. It's a wonderful movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to spoil the movie, mm-hmm. um, but um, yeah. So, motivation manifesto. I'm, I'm currently reading that. Um, I can't. I can't. For the life of me, right now, I can't recall <laughs> any other book. You know, that might suggest that I don't read at all, <laughs> or it might suggest that I have 
memory <laughs> failure. Um, and we talked about memory <laughs> failure in, in RDTM, yeah. right? It's yeah. a curvilinear relationship. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Age and memory capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Up to a certain point, uh, you're good at remembering. Yeah. And up to, and then past that point, you start to have memory impairment. <laughs> I mean, you have too many books to recommend. Or maybe, yes, yeah. I have too many yeah. books. So it's, it's really about choice paralysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah choice. I can't choose. I can't choose. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we can end here. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you yeah. so thank much. You. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for, for coming. Uh, yeah. yeah Highly really enjoyable. Happy. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you for thank coming. You so yeah. much. Thank you so much. Have a nice yes. day. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. I applaud you both. Oh. <laughs> and also. If you get to hear me now.